Welcome to Season 8, Episode 37 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's a windy Tuesday on the 17th of November and we're going to discuss what's been going, what's been going on in the community and joining me this week are Mark. Hello. Hello Mark. Alan. Hello. And Laura. Hiya. Hiya. How is everyone? Windy. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Try not to blow away. How's everyone's internet holding up tonight? Just No, I had chili for tea. Oh. <laughs> oh. My, my internet oh, seems dear. fine, but well. then mine's in cables under the Good. ground. It, it looks like then we're about 50-50 as to whether this is going to work yes. or not tonight. Shall yeah, so we, we um, get once on again go to apologise in advance for, for the, the blustery conditions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. And it's time for some news. Oh, Mark? sorry. <laughs> uh, Valve launches a massive sale of SteamOS, that is to say Linux titles, to coincide with the launch of Steam Machines. Ooh. Yes. Anything you haven't already got? Uh, quite a few, actually. Um, Alien Isolation is probably the biggest title on there. And there's a few other uh, sort of big name games like Shadow of Mordor and a few other sort of smaller independent games. Uh, quite a few of them been around on Linux for a while. Mm. But yeah, And I, I've noticed on the Steam client, when you're looking through the store, you get a little Windows logo for Windows compatible games. And you get a little OS X thing for Mac mm. games. Yes. And Linux used to be a little penguin, but yes. now it's a Steam logo. Yeah. Interestingly, on my, this the, on my Steam box. Is this the Steam Play thing? Mm. Yes. Steam Play. Oh, no, that's as well. Yeah. No, uh, Steam OS is what it means. Steam yeah. OS so, as in Linux. But, but says, they've I, changed the, their logo, so it doesn't say it's not a, a penguin. It's 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 Steam OS. But it says Steam right. Play Nick, beyond that if it's got Steam Play support, whatever that is. Oh, no, Steam Play, yeah, so, Steam Play means that you buy it once and you get it on all platforms. Uh so how do I tell visually if a title is available on Linux or not? If it's, it has a Steam logo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So if it's got the Steam pistons, then mm -hmm. it's good. Yes. Or you yes. just select the filter Linux and just trust yeah. that everything. Well, the, yeah, the filter, the filter for, for Linux is called SteamOS Linux. Mm. Mm. Um, in fact, on my Steam box, um, in big picture mode, by default, if you go to the store, it now only shows you stuff which you can play with your current setup, which is interesting. So it's, uh, I think it's stuff which is controller. Or in fact, no, now I'm using a Steam controller. It's probably not just stuff which has controller support, but stuff specifically that runs on Linux, unless I tell it not to filter. Ah. Mm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the first Linux ransomware program, Linux Encoder 1, has been cracked due to errors made by the creators when implementing the encryption algorithms. So there's now a free tool available from the antivirus firm Bitdefender that can decrypt the encrypted files that Linux Coder, Coder made uh, due to the flaw in its design. That's cool. So what, what does what? this do? Is it like, is it like the, the things that pop up? from do dodgy downloads that say, ha-ha, we've encrypted all yes. your files, you have to phone us and give us loads of money over Bitcoin or whatever, and, and we'll unlock yeah. that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, that, that is exactly that sort of thing. Yes. And it, does it infect uh, clients, like desktops? Yeah, I believe so. Wow. But yes, they made... We, they we made... really have arrived. <laughs> you do have to run it as root. You do have to run it as root, however, so it's not <laughs> like, you know, it's not quite like Windows where you click something and it silently happens in the background. You have right. to interact with mm. this thing. And, so you have to, you know... Detach it from your email, <laughs> you, you decode it, yeah. run it under sudo, and yeah. then add yourself to the right group. And yeah. <laughs> you have and to, then you have to really infected. want to have all your files in encrypted. <laughs> and then, and then, if you've jumped all through all through those hoops, then you you have to hope that the malware authors actually know how crypto works and haven't used it a, used a predictable um, key a seed for the encryption. One which is no less on the date of the files which have been encrypted. Exactly. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Ooh. 
Cool. In hardware news, uh, and also Ubuntu in the wild news, NVIDIA has launched the Jetson TX1 module. Uh, I don't think they're going into space with it. It sounds like it. Uh, It's designed (laughs) to power artificial intelligence. Uh, It says AI in brackets there, if those who didn't know that. And (laughs) provide machine learning in autonomous robots and drones uh, to be central to advanced driver assistance systems and be an ideal solution for mobile medical imaging. Ooh, that sounds like a, tr- uh, what are they called? Not a tricorder. What's the yep. thing that they tricorder used Tricorder in- is what you're after. Was it a yeah. tricorder? Yeah, yeah that would be cool. Yeah. Um, it's claimed that thanks to the powerful components, the Jetson TX1 is the first embedded computer module that can learn to recognize objects or interpret information. Mm-hmm. I call lies. Lots of things interpret information. <laughs> <laughs> I can write a bit of Perl interprets information. That's hogwash. No, it interprets India. data. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Still, information's data. Yeah. Quite a sophisticated um, board, though. Yeah, it's got quite a lot of stuff on it. I'm not going to read out all the specs, but it's like a decent ARM um, A57 CPU, um, Maxwell GPU with 256 CUDA cores, uh, 4K video encode and decode. So lots of I.O., lots and lots of ports and a capability to plug lots of different things into it. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting device. Yeah, I, I guess people are prototyping with it now, with a view to it being embedded or something based on this being embedded, like further on down the line. I think most of their potential clients are in automotive and things like that. Right. So, like the Teslas of this world in the future perhaps, might have perhaps, this kind of yeah. stuff with Intel, yeah. the Google self-driving cars. I guess they're aiming for the next generations of those. Mm. Yeah. Interesting seeing Interesting. Um, automated driver assistance systems as an actual non uh, sort of derivative name for self-driving cars. I wondered like, because when cars first came out, they were called horseless carriages by some people. <laughs> I've been wondering what is the actual name that people are going to call self-driving cars once they stop calling them self-driving cars. Well, we can exclusively reseal it's ADAS. Or ADAS. That's the act. <laughs> my, uh, my friend Steve used to call them personal transport modules. <laughs> That's yeah. that's what he used to call his car. I spent the weekend cleaning yeah. my personal transport module. In uh, <laughs> in the aviation industry, um, we refer to passengers as self loading cargo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Brilliant. Anyway, moving on. Um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation and Code Club have merged. Um, so, Code Club is a volunteer led charitable organisation that runs after school programmes to get children coding. And I think, Alan, you've done stuff with Code Club. Yeah, we interviewed uh, one of the original founders about we did. two or three seasons ago. Um, and yeah, I did a bit of Code Club at a local school. Um, it's interesting. It kind of it kind of makes sense because mm. you know, Raspberry Pi, they want to be in schools, they want to be in education and Code Club you know, are doing that kind of thing. So it's kind of a match made in heaven, mm. I guess. Is Raspberry it Pi really Foundation is. a separate sort of educational bit from the manufacturing side? Of, oh, or is Martin it just... knows all about this. Uh, well, I wouldn't say I know all about it, but I did have a conversation you know, more than with us. Ben Nuttall at Og Camp about it. Oh, right. And there, there, there are. It's one organisation, and as far as I understand oh, okay. it, there's sort of two divisions of the organisation. And there's one part where they um, sell, uh, d- d- sort of design, develop, and sell their hardware, and then the money made from those hardware sales then get funneled into the um educational mission of the okay. raspberry pi foundation so there's one part of the company making the money and then there's another part that's doing the whole education and outreach piece that spend the money right. and that's the the basic sort of structure of the organization so i guess that the making money bit will be funneling money into the code club now in order to help with that uh, educational and outreach um, sort of mission of the uh, of the foundation. Which sounds cool. like an ideal setup to me. It does. Mm. It does, doesn't it? Mark. ISPs have told the Common Select Committee that £117 million budgeted for the UK gov- budgeted by the UK government will not cover the massive costs of collecting everyone's data. MPs have been warned that consumers' oh, broadband bills will have to go up if the investigatory powers bill is passed due to the massive cost of implementation. So this is uh, we've been we've been whinging and moaning about this uh, for for several months now. Uh, rumours of the government trying to ban encryption. 
with a, a new a new law. Uh, they've actually now published a draft of the bill. It's called the Draft Investigatory Powers Bill. Um, and they're not saying that they're trying to ban encryption. They are saying that they want to compel ISPs to collect everybody's, um, what are they saying, web web browsing history they want to collect the websites you visit internet, but not internet the web... records right, internet it's records, your internet yeah. record they want it to they want to connect the, the the sites you visit but not the pages you visit and the people Sometimes. you talk to but not what you say so right. all, all right then so yeah. somebody's put in a freedom of information request for theresa may's um phone record internet, internet record oh brilliant and you know isps are really really good at keeping hold of this information and yes. making sure it's secure and nobody because we haven't had any that, we so. haven't had any stories about uh about no. isps losing customer data i feel recently. confident good or any but, uh, company at all i was going to say you know i i seem to remember in the not too distant past an isp losing all of their customers email mm. forever and for always <laughs> so asking say isps isn't so. to collect and retain this data is a pretty tall order i think Yes. However, Mark, I have to take issue. Uh, you said we've been whinging and moaning about this for a while. Uh, I think that frames it badly. Oh, okay. I think we've yes. been uh, we've been protesting about this and arguing our case. I think whinging and moaning makes it sound like it's not something that we should be protesting. Mm, much about. better put. Thank you. But, but also, corrected. encouragingly, if you read the commentary from the ISPs themselves, it sounds like they do not want to do this because it is going to be a massive pain for them yeah. and a huge expense. Yeah. Uh, and an onus of responsibility that they really don't want. In yeah. fact, I think one of the quotes was, "Is um, you know, is this feasible?" One of the one of the uh, ISP sort of CTOs was asked, and they said, "It's perfectly feasible with an infinite budget." Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. What you say is they're pushing all this responsibility onto them. That, I mean, other companies have proven they can't do this, like keep mm. stuff safe. And, and yeah. The the other thing is is that if you've got all of this data, then you have to be able to do something with it. Um, it seems to be that whenever there is some atrocity uh, carried out, you know, in the world, and we're sitting here with the backdrop of Paris at the moment, quite often you hear that uh, these people were known to the security services, and therefore it's not about the data that's being collected but the efficacy with which that data can actually be mined and interpreted so i wonder whether ha having access to all of this data will actually help or or change anything for the better anyway mm. and they'll also become a massive target the isp will be a target for well look i can get all this data about this politician or this celebrity or i could get all this data about you know anyone in the public sphere and possibly embarrass them by showing their internet record so that's an excellent point to them. if you go anyway. to uh, the open rights yeah. group website they've got some good summaries because the bill is a 300 page document of legalese um they've got some good summaries of um the highlights and lowlights of the bill um and advice for yeah. writing to your mp and telling them not to vote for it Mm, that's really useful, actually. I shall definitely be taking a look at that and drafting a response. And I suggest everyone in the UK who listens to this does the same. Moving on, Martin, what's the next item? Uh, we've had the first release candidate of QMU 2.5, which, among other updates, which are technically proficient and outstanding, it now supports a VertIO GPU 3D mode which allows for guest virtual machines to have access to the 3D and OpenGL backend of the host's hardware. Mm, so effectively 3D pass-through pass from the guest to the host. Uh, and this will work in conjunction with the new uh, DRM driver that's in, uh, this is not digital rights management, it's direct rendering manager, oh. for Linux 4.4. <laughs> And uh, the work that's already been done in Mesa and Gallium 3D. I always wondered why there was a load of DRM code in the Linux kernel. Uh, well, there is, of course, because, you know, some companies yes. aren't. But I mean, um... with, re with regards to <laughs> GPU drivers, I wasn't really yeah. sure what, what it was. But right, so direct Don't rendering worry, mode. Right, thank we you. We weren't <laughs> laughing at you. Um, that's, that's the way you get at the hardware for accelerated graphics. Right. 
So this is this is super exciting because for a long I've been a, a a lover of QEMU for a very long time. I remember giving a talk at at uh, yes. Hampshire Linux User Group about ten years ago about how fantastic QEMU was and how the guy who created it, uh, Fabrice Bellard, uh, is uh, you know an absolute genius. He's the same guy who came up with FFmpeg as well and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and I think he did a DOS virtual machine in JavaScript yeah, as well. He's, yeah. he's just, you know, he's, <laughs> that was he's him. Oh, he's, he's a prolific yes. open source contributor. He is. He's amazing. And and QEMU is one of those things that actually is baked into lots of different things. It's used a lot in, in obviously in, in virtual machines, um, and powers a lot of the different virtual machine technology underneath. There's a there's Q, QMU underneath a lot of things like KVM, for example. Isn't it used KVM. for um, like the Android emulator in the Android? Um, yep. What's it What's it called? Development kit. Yeah. SDK. SDK. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, this is good news, and the QMU has always been the one that's been like the reliable stalwart, and it also has um, another thing that QMU is good for is cross building, like creating an environment in which you can build for another architecture. So I use it when I'm building ARM HF binaries for a phone but on an Intel mm-hmm. uh, laptop. It's really, really cool. I use it for building Raspberry Pi 2 images on my Intel PC. Sweet. Awesome. So, yes, congratulations to the QMU team. Moving on, in an interview with The Intercept, Edward Snowden explains how to reclaim your privacy. Snowden describes some operational security practices he thinks everyone should adopt, why he thinks Tor is the most important privacy-enhancing technology project being used today, and why we should not live our lives as if we're electronically naked. Who are? Mm. Mm. So what does, he, what does he suggest we should do? Uh, disconnect from the internet and uh, <laughs> live in a cave, I think. Actually, no, it's interesting because the, the, the journalist that all, uh, uh, interviewed him, who, whose name I've forgotten, I'm terribly sorry, um, you know, turned up as if he was going to have some sort of, you know, security assessment from from Snowden. So he had his mobile phone uh, turned off and inside a Faraday bag mm-hmm. and, you know, all sorts of uh, measures. And apparently Edward Snowden put him at ease and said he could turn his phone on and he could contact his colleagues to <laughs> arrange a meet up and all the rest of it. But um, Snowden goes on to talk about some uh utilities that are accessible and easy to use for smartphones to help um uh ensure your privacy so he talks about red phone and uh secure signal. tech secure tech secure uh, signal yeah tech signal and a couple of other things you know that anyone can install and aren't cumbersome to use but then goes into deeper detail about um if you're a future whistleblower, these are perhaps some of the uh, countermeasures you want to consider. And if you're in an oppressive regime, these are perhaps some of the communications channels that you want to consider. And also, if you're using those communication channels, that you may actually be singling yourself out by using something unusual that stands yeah. out from the rest of the pack. So mm. it's a very good read. And it's not... That is worrying. Um, it's not sort of um, crazy complicated stuff. There is some technical detail in there, but it is something that everyone could do. And I like the piece about electronically naked because that was a new term that I've not come across. But um, that's basically talking about using HTTPS mm. where you can or using HTTPS everywhere to ensure that, you know, all of your data is not just being spread around the Internet liberally. And right. also he talks about... Um, information sharing so when you're asked to provide answers to questions like what is the name of your first pet that those are not actually useful bits of data other parties to hold about you and that there are better ways to actually assert Mm. the identity of the person connecting to the the service so it's a very interesting read and uh, one that everyone can uh, make sense of it's funny you should mention that i have a friend who uh i recently uh um I uh, said happy birthday to, and uh, he said, uh, it's not my birthday. And I said, oh, Skype told me it was your birthday. And he gives, like, you know, so this is like Skype a fake date of birth. Um, I've had that yeah. before. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, I think that's all we've got time for in the news. <laughs> It's 
time for the community news and events. And the first up, uh, it's a time for the regular community council election. Uh, so uh, the members of the Ubuntu Community Council expired, not, you know, actually, I'm talking figuratively, <laughs> um, expired from their roles and... Uh, the announcement. I just had an image of Mark going, Exclamus! <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that was probably a Harry Potter reference I don't get, but I laughed anyway. Um, the, uh, <laughs> so um, it, there were some nominations made, and uh, the ballots are now available for people to cast their vote. Uh, and um, if you're an Ubuntu member, you can vote. If you're not, you can't. And then at the end of that, uh, the uh, result will be new members on the uh, community council. Cool. Yes, because we put out the call for nominations mm -hmm. a few yep. episodes back, didn't we? How many uh, people I are standing? Do you oh, know? Christ, Eleven. As many as that, right? Yeah, wow. yeah. For seven so, positions, three of whom are already um, members of the council. Uh, yes, three incumbents and uh, so that's our yeah. new fresh blood. That's really good. Mm. That is good. I was kind of worried when we announced it that given the recent hoo-hahs around the community council that um, there wouldn't be more. Well, there, you know, honestly, there are some who've stepped down. I know I know, Liz has stepped down and she's absolutely, um, you know, exhausted through what's happened over the last couple of years and, um, you know, didn't want to stand again. I did ask her because you, you have to be nominated to you know and you have to agree yeah. to be nominated and i pinged her on irc and said hey uh love what you've done over the last couple of years could you please stay on and she said no i, I think this is you know um the end for her on the council how long how long is your tenure when you two get years a position on the council? it's a it's a two-year stint and then uh there's right. another election you know um, some people, obviously, you know, some people have been on the council for a few years, yeah. like uh, Daniel Holbach has been on there for probably longer than everyone except Mark Shuttleworth, who has a permanent position. Um, but uh, it's, um, yeah, it's only through virtue of the fact that people voted for him that, he, you know, he's he's on there. Um, and the same for, you know, some of the others. Yeah. So get voting if you're an Ubuntu member. Hmm. Cool. The next event in our community news is Ubuntu Community Appreciation Day, which is on November the 20th every year. And this is open to everybody, whether they're a user, developer or non-developer, uh, a non-developer contributor, rather. Um, and it's a way of uh, saying thank you to people that make Ubuntu and the Ubuntu community. So it's just, just an opportunity to say thank you to someone uh, who has done something that you appreciate in the Ubuntu world. And get a card. Yeah, it's like cards. Valentine's Day, but for, you know, nerds. Um, <laughs> I'm going to regret saying that. Uh, uh, you it's, are. it's really nice. It's a nice way of just like having to think about, it is. you know, who over the last year you've, you know, you've, you've interacted with or someone who's fixed a bug for you or someone who's mentored you to file a bug or whatever it might be, have a think and maybe write a blog post or send them a tweet or whatever you think and just say thank you to them. Because, uh, you know, everyone appreciates a little bit of thanks now and then. Yep. There's a Google code-in starting on the mm. December the 7th. Um, and it's a contest introducing 13 to 17-year-old pre-university students to open source software development. And Ubuntu is mentoring, uh, is a mentoring organization yes, this year. It's cool. like Google Summer of Code. But uh, and shorter and younger yep, people. Winter. And the tasks are all much oh, smaller. Yes. So Google Summer of Code is very much, you know, I'm going to implement this giant feature and spend, you know, a month or more doing it. This is a, each organization mm -hmm. that's a mentoring organization has a large number, like maybe 100 or more smaller bite size paper cut style tasks that they want to get done and puts them all up on the website as a list. And uh, students can pick those up, do them and get rewards. And there's a... A, you know, a grand prize where Google, you know, there's there's minor prizes like you know t-shirts and all kinds of other merchandise and stuff, but there's a grand prize of um, getting a paid trip out to Mountain View at Cal uh, in California, which is very nice. Yeah, nice. So we're cool. we're 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 a mentoring organization and starts on December the seventh. So if you know any uh, education establishment, schools or whatever who might be interested in getting involved, then um, point them at codein.withgoogle.com. Cool. Uh, next up is Pi Wars, the Raspberry Pi Robotics Challenge Competition. 
Pi Wars is a challenge-based robotics competition in which Raspberry Pi-controlled robots are created by teams and then compete in various challenges to earn points. Now, I'm imagining some sort of Craig Charles hosted <laughs> Robot Wars style contest like they used to be on the BBC. It's not oh. quite no. level of not quite that level of carnage. No. And do it's, points uh, mean it's prizes? More obstacle courses and things. Martin, like that will nature. there be rotating knives? That's what I need to know. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe we should get the uh, the organisers on and have a yes, chat to them. That sounds like an excellent idea, but it's far That's, too late, so we yes. can't. This is happening. Uh, this is happening at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory <laughs> on Sunday, the fifth of December, twenty fifteen, from ten till six thirty awesome. in the evening. Uh, following mm. on the uh, Pi theme, uh, the tenth Egham Raspberry Pi Jam is on the seventeenth of January in the new year. Uh, bring along your game centers, your game controllers, your game either on screen or physical Raspberry Pi and show what you've got. Maybe you've got or made something amazing with your Christmas present. Uh, so it's all about gaming, gamification and uh, that kind of stuff. So it's a, a nice theme. It's in Egham in Surrey, uh, 17th of January, 2 o'clock till 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Cool. Yeah, you've, you've got a gamey thingy for the I Raspberry have. Pi. It's called a Picade and it's awesome. That's, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, well, that's not far from you, is it? You should take that along there because I want to have a go on it. <laughs> Actually, I just bought a, uh, a Wi-Fi dongle. Uh, someone someone tweeted that they'd bought a Wi-Fi dongle for their Raspberry Pi because mine's wired. And uh, I got this from Pi Moroni, who are the same people who made the Pi K. And uh, yeah, it's a yes. Raspberry Pi compatible um, uh, Wi-Fi dongle. But the nice thing is it's a little uh, USB dongle which is the white plastic part that you normally hold on to as you put it in and out the port, has a Raspberry Pi logo on it, like etched into it. It's really quite nice. Yeah, so it's all oh, branded oh, and, nice. and apparently yeah. works. I've not actually plugged it in yet because it's all the way over there on the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and later in January, the scale, um, it says 14. Yeah, it's really confusing. I guess it's the 14th scale. 14? I think it's the 14th, yes. I, I guess yes. so. Sounds about right. And that's at Pasadena Convention Center in California. And it's the largest community-run open source and free software conference in mm -hmm. all of North America. Wow. And I think we met some of the scale guys at Lug Radio Live US. Yeah, there's quite a quite a large contingent um, of uh, Linuxy people who go there. Like they say, it is the largest, you know. Um, yeah. We're having an UbuCon, I think we mentioned last time, uh, immediately before scale. Yes. So some of us Ubuntu types will be out there um, for the days before scale, and some of us might be staying on for scale as well. And lastly, uh, the last event is FOSDEM 2016. Uh, FOSDEM is a free and non-commercial event organised by the community for the community, and the goal is to provide a free open source uh, provide free and open source software developers and communities a place to meet and this is happening in brussels in belgium from the 30th of january to the 31st of january 2016 yeah busy old month in january isn't it's it? going to go this year yeah. yeah yeah i'd love to go i've been to Fosdown in the past couple of years and it's brilliant but unfortunately i've run out of leave to take from work this year so i'm not going to be able to make it i think it. there might be an ubuntu presence there I think there might be a few of us uh, going over. Well, there always are. There's always a bunch of people there and canonical people there, like mingling in with everyone else. Uh, last year when I went, I was bumping into canonical people all over the place. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's it's a really really good event if you're if you're into free software. It's it's, it's yeah, definitely it's worth event. going to. Um, it's at their university, and there's loads of rooms and loads of different tracks. It's very it's very difficult to have a period of time throughout the day where there's not something interesting to go to um, yeah yes and it's it, yeah. everyone seems to go there like everyone i know from the open source community i'm just sort of walking down a corridor trying to work out where i'm going next and i'll suddenly realize that i've just seen someone i know walk past and then i turn around and they're lost in a crowd <laughs> and then yes. i turn back around and someone else is in front of me is that like it's really is it like the matrix like with the lady in the red crazy. dress is it, it's like that isn't it yes exactly <laughs> she, yes awesome yes i think that's all of the news and events for this week thanks we love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh a little bit. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays, email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. Or you can leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. 
And that's all for episode 37. We'll be back next week when we'll be discussing 3D printing and bring you some command line love. So did did our connections all hold up with the wind blowing? No. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> I think we I have more. I apologise for speaking over all of you. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, who said that? <laughs> I got that. <laughs> Nurse. Yeah. Um, yes, we'll see you all uh, next week. Uh, and there's not many weeks left till Christmas. Oh, crikey. <gasps> bye bye. Uh, no. Bye. 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 Wendy Miller, anyone?